This is called the exposition of a summary. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Swati and Jetas Grove in Athanpendika's Park. There the Blessed One addressed the monks. Thus, monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Monks, I shall teach you a summary and an exposition. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the monks replied. The Blessed One said this. Monks, a monk should examine things in such a way that while he is examining them, his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally nor stuck internally. And by not craving and clinging, he does not become agitated. If his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor stuck internally, and if by not craving and clinging, he does not become agitated, then for him there's no origination of suffering. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. This is where the monks made a big mistake. Because they didn't ask him, what, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> what does this mean? And you remember what I said yesterday about not asking questions? What happens to you? If you don't understand what's being said, this Dhamma talk is not worth anything to you. Ask questions. Then soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered, now friends, the Blessed One has risen from his seat and gone into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief, without expounding the detailed meaning. That's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Do you understand what this said? Explain it to me then. Explain it to me. He means clinging and grasping, uh, essentially, for love to prevent a monk from realizing. True. Okay. That's why you should ask. Okay. Now, who will expound this in detail? Then they considered the Venerable Mahakachana as praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and asked him the meaning of this. Then the monks went to the Venerable Mahakachana and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down at one side and they told him what had taken place, adding, let the Venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The Venerable Mahakachana replied, friends, it is though a man needing heartwood seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood after he had passed over the root and the trunk. 
So it is with you, venerable sirs, that you think I should be asked about the meaning of this after you had passed the Blessed One by, when you were face to face with the teacher. For knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees. He is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma. He is the Holy One, he is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told you, so you should have remembered it. Surely, friend Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision. He is knowledge, he is the Dhamma, he is the Holy One. He is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning, as he told us, so we should have remembered it. Yet the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed, esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. The Venerable Mahakachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expounding, expounding the detailed meaning. Let the Venerable Mahakajana expound it to, without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the monks replied, the Venerable Mahakajana said this, how, friends, is consciousness called distracted and scattered externally? Here, when a monk has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness follows after the sign of form, is tied and shackled to it by gratification, in the sign of the form, is fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of the form. Then his consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally. What does that mean? When a, when a sight arises and you take it and you make a big deal out of it and your mind becomes scattered, you start thinking about it and then you start thinking about other things and all of a sudden you're not paying attention at all. Now this happens with all of the sense doors. Anytime you make a big deal out of anything, anytime you, you think, ah, oh, this is, I really like this, you're caught by it. You have craving. You have attachment. And the more you make a big deal out of something, the longer it's going to stay and the more distraction you're going to have because of it. It works that way. Now, it especially works with meditation pain. Sometimes some meditation pains can come up and they can be pretty intense. And the more you make a big deal out of having that pain and not liking it and you can't stand it anymore and you have to break your sitting, you can look forward to having that pain come up often. Many times. See, I've been doing meditation for a lot of years. And my, 
for about 20 years I was doing vipassana, straight vipassana, Mahasi Mahasi Sayada style. And what they told us to do was when a pain arises, you put your attention right in the middle of that pain and you, quote, see its true nature. You know what happens when you put your attention right in the middle of a pain? It gets real big and intense. And they seem to think that it's a good thing to have that kind of pain. Your mind gets hard. It's like a rock. Because you have aversion to pain. Pain by nature, you just want to push it away. But there is attachment there, and that's not something that they, they really recognize so well. It is very important to let go of first your thoughts about the distraction and relax. Then Notice the tight mental fist around that distraction. And let it go. The tight mental fist is aversion. So relax. Everything about the Buddha's practice is about doing this with the practice not this. Everything is about letting it be. It's about using the six R's. If you remember the definition of mindfulness, Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves. That's what we're talking about right here. Your attention moves to the form. And then you start liking it, or disliking it, whatever the case may be. But you're not seeing that there is craving there. You're not noticing craving when it comes up. And because of that, you get caught by thinking, having opinions, having ideas, liking, disliking, and then you get into your old habitual tendency of when this kind of thing arises, I always do this. Habitual tendencies are where your emotional outbursts come from. Okay. Now let's say you have Depression, that's always a good one. How does depression arise? What happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? If you are not aware of this as a process, then you start taking it personally and you start to fight with a feeling and you try to control a feeling with your thoughts. And that just causes more and more suffering. What, what is the, the very start of depression? The feeling arises, and it's not a pleasant feeling. I don't like that. 
And right after that, you have all kinds of thoughts and opinions and ideas and stories about this depressing feeling. And then you get into trying to control the feeling with your thoughts. You think that this is you, this is yours, this is who you are. And feelings are one thing and thoughts are something else. The more you try to think of feeling away, the bigger and more intense the feeling becomes. It's really kind of an amazing process. And it's easy to recognize. But because of your old habitual tendency, of trying to think a feeling away instead of letting go of your thoughts about the feeling and relax and allow that feeling to be there by itself. It can last for years and always you're caught in the same way. Anytime you try to think a feeling away, you're causing yourself more suffering. It doesn't work. And that's how you become distracted and scattered. Because you're trying to control whatever arises with your thoughts. And you can get real <clears throat> attached to trying to handle it that way. And that's like the, uh, the saying that Einstein, you try to do the same thing over and over in the same way and expect a different result. Well, don't do that. That's why it's so important <coughs> for you to really recognize that your mind is distracted. Release the distraction. Don't hold on. Don't make a big deal out of whatever is pulling your attention away. You're going to hear that a lot. Don't make a big deal out of it. It's just a thought. It's just a feeling. Is it yours? Did you ask it to come up? Well, why take it personally? Why try to control it? Why try to make it be the way you want it to be? It doesn't work. So, you let it be by itself and relax. Smile. Come back to your object of meditation. Now, your object of meditation when you're doing your daily activities can be smiling. Just stay with the smile. Kind of laugh with it. Keep your mind uplifted. And then that feeling that was so troublesome is, it's just a feeling. Well, I don't need to hold on to that. Let's let that one go. So your habitual tendency is where your emotional upsets really take hold. In Pali, they call it bhava. And Bhikkhu Bodhi says it's existence, and he says it's other things. But my teacher was Usilananda. He was a very, very famous Burmese teacher. And I had a long talk with him about the definition of bhava. 
and he started agreeing with me when I started saying habitual tendency. Because habitual tendency, that is a practical way of looking at how you cause yourself suffering and how you get caught with the suffering. It's making a big deal and then trying to control the feelings with your thoughts. And the more you try to control the feelings with your thoughts, the bigger and more intense the feelings become. Now, when I was doing so much Mahasi-style meditation, I had a meditation main that was really, truly remarkable, and it lasted for about 15 years. Because I always treated it in the same way, because that's what I was taught to do. I had, it's like somebody took a knife, and they went like this, and then they turned the blade. And then I'd be sitting, and then I could hardly lift my, my hand up off, off my leg. It was so intense. Eventually, my mind started developing some equanimity for it. And eventually it went away by itself. But I'm here to tell you, you don't need to do that for 15 years. <laughs> okay. So what you need to do is become familiar with how this process works. What happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? When you start seeing this as a process, and you start seeing that it's part of an impersonal process, you're going to start losing the attachment to it. You're going to stop taking it things so personally. There's some people that they have really, really heavy-duty uh, anxieties and anxiety attacks and these kind of things. I was teaching uh, and this lady came and she sat down right in front and, and she couldn't get out and she started to have an anxiety attack and she was hearing me talk about what you do when you have this kind of feeling arise and she thought well let's see if what this monk says is right now whenever she had anxiety attacks before she would uh, freak out for a little while and then she would go run to her room and she would stay in her room for three or four days and then the anxiety went away. And she was, she wasn't going to interrupt the talk that I was giving. And she thought, well, let's see if what this monk is showing me is, is real. Let's see if it works. And she said she, she broke out in sweats and she really wanted to get up and run away and be by herself. But she started using the six R's. And she started recognizing, releasing, relaxing. And she said after two minutes, it went away. The anxiety went away. Hmm. Imagine that, would you? And I said, after the Dhamma talk, I was, she was taking me back to wherever I was staying. And she was telling me about it. I said, do you have any anxiety now? I said, no. Oh. So now you know what to do when anxiety arises. 
Yeah, I think I do. See, the biggest problem that we have is taking things personally and then trying to control your feelings with your thoughts. And it doesn't work, but we keep doing it over and over again. We keep on causing ourselves so much suffering because of our habitual tendency. <coughs> so when I was talking with Lucille Ananda about habitual tendency, he started agreeing with it. And he, he really, he started teaching that way. Because it is something that's very practical, something that you need to understand. The nonsense thoughts that <coughs> goes through our minds is just, a, uh, one of my other teachers used to call it rubbish. <laughs> and it really is. It is rubbish. It's just nonsense stuff that we take personally and then we don't like it and then we fight with it and then we throw it on other people and, and get in fights with them about it. What, what is that? <laughs> don't need to do that. See, yesterday when I was talking about I want you to have fun, I'm being serious. If you don't have fun with life, why do you want to continue? <laughs> It's like at, at when we were little kids, we were four, five, six years old, everything was great fun. And it, it was it's really nice. And then all of a sudden we get to an, a little bit older and then everything gets serious. Why? Well, who's the one that made you serious? Why'd you do that to yourself? You don't need to. The more you have a light mind, the better your mindfulness becomes. The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. Keep your mind uplifted. And you'll see that your mind does not become so distracted and scattered. And things that used to bother you very heavily. Now they're not going to anymore. So with every one of these sense doors, seeing forms with the eyes, hearing sounds with the ears, smelling odors with the nose, tasting things with the tongue, feeling sensual, or feeling tangible things with your body, or thinking with mind. Treat them all in the same way. Yes, your mind's going to pull your attention away. So, let it be there. So what? Sometimes you, you have, have a tendency to think that this is real important and I have to do it this way or else. Well, you know, when you start doing more loving kindness, when you start staying with your spiritual friend for longer periods of time, one of the things that's going to happen for you is you're going to start to be more organized. You're going to be more at ease with whatever you're doing while you're doing it. Every time that you stay with your spiritual friend for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, 
now your mind is going to start to develop more and more balance. And this happens at every level of meditation. Now I teach jhana, but I teach jhana vipassana at the same time. That's the way it says you do it in the suttas. It's real important that you understand that the jhana practice is not an absorption where you just stay on one thing. This is an aware kind of jhana that you're practicing. And jhana is a word that has been misunderstood for, oh, 2,000 years or so. <laughs> because they, the Hindus started taking over that word. And they were practicing one-pointed kinds of concentration. And that is the way it's understood right now that jhana means concentration. Jhana means a level of your understanding. Okay. It doesn't mean that your mind is just focused on one thing. It means that your understanding, when you get into a certain level of meditation, your understanding gets deeper. And you start having a lot of what I call oh wows. You'll, you'll have, oh, that's how that worked. Oh, wow, look at that. I wanted to call this meditation the oh wow meditation. <laughs> but I got talked out of it. <laughs> I'm still not happy about it. <laughs> So the thing that you have to understand is anything you make a big deal out of, it's going to stay in your mind. And it's going to cause all kinds of suffering. So that's why the six R's are so incredibly important. Recognize that your mind is distracted. Release the distraction. Don't even hold on to it for for a half a second. Just let it be there by itself and relax. Quite often, this is where people get caught, is when they recognize that their mind is distracted, and they want to release it, but it's kind of interesting, and I want to see where it's going to go. <laughs> uh, and that's what I call making a big deal out of it. There's nothing so interesting that you need to hold on to it. Let it be. Relax. Smile. Come back to your friend. Stay with your friend as long as you can. So let go of the attachments because that's going to cause a lot of suffering. If you hold on to what your, your comes up in your mind and you think it's, it's really necessary that I got to go through this, well, you're causing yourself a lot of suffering. So, be nice to yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Don't be hard on yourself because something comes up and it keeps coming up. Okay, so it keeps coming up. So what? Just gently let it go. Don't try to get into your old habitual tendencies and cause yourself more and more suffering. You don't need to do that.
And how, friends, is consciousness called not distracted and scattered externally? Here, when a person has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness does not follow after that sign, is not tied and shackled by gratification, by liking it or wanting it to stay around, is not fettered by the fetter of craving, then his consciousness is called not distracted and scattered. Okay? When he has heard a sound with the ear, smelt an odor with the nose, tasted a flavor with the tongue, touched a tangible with the body, cognized a mind object with mind, if his consciousness does not follow after that sign, make a big deal out of it, is not tied and shackled by liking it, wanting it to stay around, is not fettered by craving, then his consciousness is called not distracted and scattered externally. And how, friends, is the mind called stuck internally? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A person enters upon and abides in the first jhana. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. If his consciousness follows after that joy and happiness born of seclusion and is tied and shackled by gratification, in the joy and happiness born of seclusion, then his mind is called stuck internally. It's real easy to get attached to having joy arise and hold on to it, but I generally won't allow that to happen for you. I'll push you along faster than that. But it's, I, I have had some students that they got real attached to the joy. They've never experienced anything like that in their life before. And to have joy like that arise and stay as long as you're attached to it, it's hard to let it go. But eventually I, I got them to let it go because there's a lot better things than joy arising on down the way, I promise you. So it doesn't matter what jhana you're in, you can get attached to being in that jhana. If you get to the third jhana, your mind is tranquil, your mind is has a reasonable amount of equanimity in it and full awareness and you say, I'm going to stay here for a while. I like this one. <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting pretty good at, at hustling you along. One of the things that I and that I tell almost all of my students these days is that there was a, a book in the 60s and it was called A uh, Crack in the Cosmic Egg. And that's what I'm doing for you. I'm putting a crack in your egg. <laughs> so you now you have a weak spot that you can get out, but you have to get out. You have to do the work to get out of that egg. But the, uh, the understanding you're going to have for this retreat is going to be so much deeper and so much uh, 
easier to understand that you will change your life. I promise. If you follow directions, follow what I'm showing you. I have many thousands of students and I, I know that this path does work and it works very nicely. So the more you smile, the more you have a light mind and don't take things seriously, the better your progress is going to be. So, <clears throat> and how, friends, is the mind called not stuck internally? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a person enters upon and abides in the first jhana. If his consciousness is not follow, has not, excuse me, if his consciousness does not follow after that joy and happiness born of seclusion, is not tied and shackled by the like of the joy and happiness born of seclusion, is not fettered by the fetter of gratification and craving in the joy and happiness born of seclusion, then his mind is called not stuck internally. Okay. How, friends, is there agitation due to craving and clinging? Here, an untaught, ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form, or material form as in self, or self as in material form. That material form of his changes and becomes different. With the change and becoming different of that material form, his consciousness is preoccupied with the change of the material form. Agitated mental states born of preoccupation with the change of the material form arise and remain obsessing mind. That's a real problem, the obsessing mind. I want it this way, and I want it this way now. Because his mind is obsessed, he is anxious, distressed, and concerned. And due to craving and clinging, he becomes agitated. Now, this is a, a map that I'm, that I'm giving you right now. This is exactly how this stuff works. He regards feeling as self, or he regards perception as self, or formations as self, or consciousness as self. That consciousness of his changes and becomes otherwise, and with that change, his consciousness becomes preoccupied with that change of consciousness, agitated states of mind born of preoccupation with the change arise together and remain obsessing his mind 
Because his mind is obsessed, he is anxious, distressed, and concerned. Due to craving and clinging, he becomes agitated. Hmm. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? That seems like that's the way it works. For some reason, I haven't been able to figure out why we always want things to stay the same. We don't like change very much. And everything is changing all the time. And it gets us, we be, can become real obsessed with the whole idea of let's make it the same. I want it to be this way. But when it's not, what happens? You become more and more obsessed. You become more and more demanding and trying to make your thoughts control your feelings. See how this is all starting to intertwine a little bit. And it's this habit, this bad habit, that we have developed over the years of our life that causes us to suffer so much. The more you use the six R's and the kinder you are to yourself when things don't go exactly like you want them to be, the more you have what I call in the Eightfold Path harmonious communication with yourself. The lighter life becomes, the easier it is to accept the fact that things are going to change. And you're going to be letting go of that habitual tendency that always causes so much upset. So it's a real necessary part of the practice. If you find that you're being hard on yourself because you think you should be doing better than you are, you should laugh. Because <laughs> you're being crazy. And you're being demanding. And laughing changes from I am that to it's only that. And you will see much more clearly how to let go of that suffering. Laughing is a wonderful tool. But you don't have to be laughing out loud. You, you can laugh with just in your mind. How goofy is that? Every time you get serious, guess who's causing themselves suffering? Guess who's obsessed? Guess who doesn't like what's happening right now? How much do you beat yourself up because of it? More than a little. One of the things that the Buddha said that was really, really important is that anybody who truly loves themselves will never harm another being. But how much time do we spend being hard on ourselves? We're going to make mistakes, and it's okay to make mistakes. Just don't make the same mistake over and over again. And don't be hard on yourself because you made a mistake. And even the Buddha made mistakes. There's sometimes some monks would come and they'd do some kind of weird thing and they'd say, okay, monks, don't do that anymore. And other monks would come along and they'd say, well, that's not such a good rule. 
Oh, okay, then that must change it. <laughs> so even the Buddha made mistakes, and it's okay to make mistakes. But be kind to yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Don't beat yourself up. This is real important. Every time you beat yourself up for making a mistake, causing pain to yourself or somebody else, every time you do that, that's unwholesome, isn't it? That's taking it personally. That's causing yourself more and more pain. Now, one of the things that I, I do is I do teach people how to forgive themselves. And this is a real big thing. Because you could have done something when you were five years old and you still feel guilty about it. And if you feel guilty about it, that means it's been clouding the way you see the world since you were five years old. And that makes fear arise, and that makes anxiety arise, and all kinds of problems. So, <clears throat> it's real important to understand how mind actually works. And the way you're doing that is by doing this practice right now. Now, the, the whole reason that hindrances arise is because in the past you broke some precepts. Okay? And you're holding a guilty feeling because of it. But the way you purify yourself, the way you let go of that guilty feeling, is by using the six R's. It might come up again. Okay, so it comes up again. So what? Treat it in the same way. Use the six R's. That is how you purify your mind. That is how you can actually attain Nibbana. I'm going to tell you something that you've probably never heard before. Every time you use the six R's, you are experiencing Nibbana. What does Nibbana mean? Ni means no, Bana means fire. Every time you use the six R's and you let go of that craving, you're letting go of the fire and now you you have a purified mind. Okay, this is called mundane Nibbana. You have to use mundane Nibbana a lot of times before you get to the super mundane. But it's still Nibbana. And boy, I've gotten in some real arguments with people on the internet because of, what do you talk, where'd you hear about that? Well, I'm a monk. <laughs> <laughs> I hear about these kind of things all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the way to purify yourself. Don't get over serious with it. Keep a light mind. With a light mind, your mind is more alert. You see, I, of course, I had 20 years of heavy mind, of always having tightness in my head and going to the teacher and complaining that I always had this tightness in my head and they'd say, well, don't pay attention to it, it'll go away eventually. And it didn't until I found a 
how important it is to get into the suttas and start to understand what the suttas are talking about. See, I've, I've gone to a lot of teachers. I've, I was in Asia for 12 years and I was going to all of the best teachers around that I could find. Some of them I would just spend a day or two with them because they weren't suitable for me. But sometimes I would spend six weeks or three months or a year with, with a, a different teacher. And I was always asking about craving. What is craving? How are you supposed to recognize craving when it comes up? I mean, it's got to be important, right? We <laughs> talk about it a lot. <laughs> How are you supposed to let go of craving? Well, by finally getting uh, into the, the uh, suttas, I started seeing what craving was. Craving is a tension and tightness that rises in your head. But it doesn't only arise in your head. The thing is, because your, your, your brain is like this, and there's other lobes and stuff, and it goes all the way down your spine, there is a meninges that goes all the way down your spine. It's all the way around your brain. And every time you have a thought or a feeling, there's expansion that against the the, that meninges, and you can recognize that. And when you let it be, you're not only letting be the tension and tightness in your head, in your mind, you're letting be in your whole body. And eventually, your body becomes real, peaceful, real calm, without having a lot of distractions. So, finding out what craving is and how to recognize it, that, that's pretty major. And it took me a while to figure it out because I was just going by what it said in the Satipatthana Sutta. It says you tranquilize a bodily formation. Well, I was tranquilizing every part of my body that I could think of. <laughs> and then I, I started thinking as I was walking to my room one day, you know, I've always had this tension and tightness in my head. I wonder if that's what it is. Now, I, had, I was considered a very, very advanced meditator. Okay, and they, they praised me all over the place. I was never satisfied with it. So my mindfulness was pretty good. So I thought, well, let's just see what happens if I relax that tension and tightness in my head. And it blew my mind. I mean, it abs absolutely was earth-shattering because I noticed as soon as I relaxed the tension and tightness in my mind, in my head, I didn't have any more thoughts. My mind was clear. My mind was really alert. My, my mind was very awake but no distraction. Hmm. I wonder what happens if I do that again. <laughs> so I did it again. And I, I started getting real excited, so I went into my room and I sat for about two hours. And I went deeper in that two hours than the 20 years before. It was real um, and amazing deep, wonderful experience. And 
then I went to my teacher <coughs> at the time and I said, I'm going to go do a two-week self-retreat. And I told him where I was going to go. There was a cave in, in Thailand that I liked. And it was, oh, it was higher than the ceiling. It was really big and open and spacious. It was just great. Had running water in it. It couldn't get any better. <laughs> and it was close to a village so I could get food. So I went there and I started, uh, I'd get up in the morning, I'd go out for alms round, and I'd come back and I would eat and take a shower, and then I would start reading the suttas. And I read the suttas until around 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, something like that. And then I would start sitting until 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And after two weeks, I was so, it was so incredibly interesting, I couldn't stop. And I wound up staying there for three months. And I would have stayed longer, but the head monk sent somebody, another monk to come get me. I was supposed to be helping him do stuff. So I had to stop at that point. But it was a truly remarkable experience because I would read something in the sutta and I would be able to recognize how that happened in my own practice. And yeah, it, it, this works. It really works. So don't let yourself become frustrated or upset or uh, agitated because things don't work quite the way you think they should. Everybody has a different kind of experience and that's okay. But there is, uh, this method works better and faster than anything else I've seen. And I started thinking about you know, the Buddha had to, he had to be able to teach people that were not very educated. They were simple farmers. And being farmers, they had a lot to do. They had to take care of things. They, they didn't have time to mess around. So he had to be able to teach them something that worked, and it worked well, and it worked fast. And that's what this is. When, when uh, the, they talk in the suttas about the good qualities of the Sangha, of the Dhamma, one of the good qualities of the Dhamma is called Akaliko. And that means that this Dhamma is immediately effective. And it is. Because every time you use the six R's, you have let go of a craving. And you've purified your mind a little bit. And you can start feeling that after a period of time. You start noticing that. And you start noticing the change in personality. Where you used to get upset, now you don't get so upset. Now you have more balance in your mind. It's really pretty amazing. Share some merit.